So I converted this into an interactive app. So I can now generate this application online, this visualization online. And I can say, yeah, brilliant. So it's, it spawns itself. And then I can say, well, just show me the stuff that affects heart health. So let's filter that out. So heart is filtered out, so I can see if I'm curious about that. I think, no, no, I don't want to take any synthetics. I just want to see plants and, and uh, just show me herbs and plants. There we go, all the natural ingredients. Now, this app is spawning itself from the data. The data is all stored in a Google Doc, and it's literally generating itself from that data. So the data is now alive. This is a living image, and I can update it in a second. New evidence comes out. I just change a row on a spreadsheet. Douche. Again, this the image re recreates itself. We did this software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. The, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China, and this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Huh? And they said, the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life in small family. And third world is short life in large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they, no, longer lives, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast, and in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning, and they move up into that corner, and in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. People have been using this for all kinds of fun purposes. <laughs> I, actually, we're, we're not going to have to talk. We'll just show you all the slides and <laughs> remain silent. <laughs> this person was interested in the history of frustration. Uh, there's various, various types of frustration. If you stub your toe, that's a 1A arg. If the planet Earth is annihilated uh, by the Vogons to make room for an interstellar bypass, that's an 8A arg. <laughs> This person studied all the args from one through eight A's, and uh, it turns out that the less frequent args are, of course, the ones that correspond to things that are more frustrating, except, oddly, in the early 80s. Uh, we think that might have something to do with Reagan. <laughs>
the allosphere. It's a three-story metal sphere in an echo-free chamber. Think of the allosphere as a large, dynamically varying digital microscope that's connected to a supercomputer. 20 researchers can stand on a bridge suspended inside of the sphere and be completely immersed in their data. Imagine if a team of physicists could stand inside of an atom and watch and hear electrons spin. Imagine if a group of sculptors could be inside of a lattice of atoms and sculpt with their material. Imagine if a team of surgeons could fly into the brain as though it was a world and see tissues as landscapes and hear blood density levels as music. This first project is called the Allobrain and it's our attempt to quantify beauty by finding which regions of the brain are interactive while witnessing something beautiful. You're flying through the cortex of my colleague's brain our narrative here is real fMRI data that's mapped visually and sonically. The brain now a world that we can fly through and interact with. You see 12 intelligent computer agents, the little rectangles that are flying in the brain with you. They're mining blood density levels and they're reporting them back to you sonically. Higher density levels mean more activity in that point of the brain. They're actually singing these densities to you with higher pitches mapped to higher densities. This is a map of fire hydrants in New York City, but not just any fire hydrant. These are the top 250 grossing fire hydrants in terms of parking tickets. <laughs> right? So I learned a few things from this map. I really like this map. Number one, just don't park on the Upper East Side. Just don't. You'll get a park. It doesn't matter where you park. You will get a hydrant ticket. Number two, I found the two highest grossing uh, hydrants in all of New York City. And they're on the Lower East Side. And they were bringing in over $55,000 a year a year in parking tickets. And that seemed a little strange to me when I noticed it. So I did a little digging. And it turns out what you had is a hydrant and then something called a curb extension, which is like a seven-foot space to walk on, and then a parking spot. And so these cars came along, and the hydrant, that's all the way over there, I'm fine. And, they would, and there was actually a parking spot painted there beautifully for them. They would park there, and the NYPD disagreed with this designation and would ticket them. And it wasn't just me who found a parking ticket, right? This is the Google Street View car driving by, finding a same parking ticket. So I wrote about this on my blog on iQuant New York, and uh, the DOT responded. And they said, while the DOT has not received any complaints about this location, we will review the roadway markings and make any appropriate alterations. And I thought to myself, you know, typical government response, all right, I moved on with my life. But then, but then a few weeks later, something incredible happened. They repainted the spot. And for a second, I thought I saw the future of open data, because think about what happened here. For five years, for five years, this spot was being ticketed. It, you know, it was confusing. And then a citizen found something, they told uh, the city, and within a few weeks, 
the problem was fixed, right? It's amazing. And it's not, a lot of people see open data as being a watchdog. It's not. It's about being a partner. And we can empower our citizens to be better partners for government. 